Well, good morning, everybody. We are glad that you're here with us this morning um, to uh, continue our conference on uh, Machen with Dr. D.G. Hart. Uh, I won't take too much time, um, but we appreciate uh, you all coming out. Uh, many of you came here last night. We've got some new folks this morning, so thanks for coming. And uh, yeah, I'll just hand things over to you, Dr. Hart, and, and let, you, let you take things over. Thank you. <clears throat> good morning. Uh, good good morning. to see many of you back here. And um, so last night, <clears throat> for those of you who weren't here, we talked about Machen and uh, old school Presbyterianism. Wow. Good to see you. Um, <clears throat> former Hills, Hillsdale graduate back here, so there's, there's kind of solidarity. Um, and uh, the point ab about, um, the, the, the main point that carries over, I think, into t today's presentations um, was that you can't understand Machen or the OPC without understanding old school Presbyterianism, which is a, um, a, a chapter of American Presbyterian history that oftentimes many uh, Presbyterians, religious historians, other people don't know much about, don't pay much attention to. Um, and what characterized old school Presbyterianism uh, was a commitment to the doctrines of grace and defending the doctrines of grace as taught in the Westminster Confession, which is of course also taught in scripture. Um, and also a high view of Presbyterian church government. Um, and there's a long literature of uh, defense of Presbyterianism in the 19th century by these old school Presbyterians, um, based, making the case that this is what God reveals as the way to order his church. Um, I'm currently working on a history of Presbyterianism and British politics in the 15th, well, from the 16th century down to uh, the 19th or so, it's kind of s silly how wide ranging it is, but I've become much more aware too of the long uh, um, or lengthy arguments for Presbyterianism up against ep Episcopacy during the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, so what Presbyterians were doing in, in 19th century America was n not at all unusual for what Presbyterians had done back in England and Scotland uh, before them, including Ireland. So, um, but this is, generally speaking, we'll talk about this later today, uh, American Protestants, evangelicals, don't think much about the church, um, which is one of the reasons why the OPC is sort of an odd fit in American Protestantism. But anyway, so that's what we were talking about last night, Machen and old school Presbyterianism. Today, um, I'll talk this morning, this talk about Machen and mainline Presbyterianism. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> to put this in some perspective, Machen was born in 1881, died in 1937. Um, the old school and new school churches were divided between 1837 and 1869. So there was a reunion of the old school and the new school in the north in 1869. Um, and I want to contrast that reunion with something that Machen wrote um, at the end of Christianity and liberalism. He's talking about the, the, the problems, the division between liberals and conservatives uh, and what can be done at the end of this book. Um, he says, whatever solution there may be, one thing is clear. I'm sorry for the print being so fine, but... <clears throat> I don't like using PowerPoint, so uh, the fewer slides, the better. There must be somewhere groups of redeemed men and women who can gather together humbly in the name of Christ to give thanks to him for his unspeakable gift and to worship the Father through him. Such groups alone can, <clears throat> can satisfy the needs of the soul. At the present time, there is one longing of the human heart which is often forgot forgotten. It is the deep, pathetic longing of the Christian for fellowship with his brethren. One hears much, it is true, about Christian union and harmony and cooperation. I'll say more about that in a few minutes. But that the union that is meant is often a union with the world against the Lord, or at best a forced union of machinery and tyrannical committees. 
How different is the true unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace? Sometimes it is true the longing for Christian fellowship is satisfied. There are congregations, even in the present age of conflict, that are really gathered around the table of the crucified Lord. There are pastors that are pastors indeed, but such congregations in many cities are difficult to find. Weary with the conflicts of the world, one goes into the church to seek refreshment for the soul, and what does one find? This is particularly poignant in our current moment. <clears throat> Alas, too often one finds only the turmoil of the world. The preacher comes forward not out of a secret place of meditation and power, not with the authority of God's word permeating his message, not with human wisdom pushed far into the background by the glory of the cross, <clears throat> but with human opinions about the social problems of the hour or easy solutions of the vast problem of sin. Such is the sermon, and then perhaps the service is closed by one of those hymns breathing out the angry passions of 1861, which are to be found in the back part of the hymnals, probably, probably for referring here to the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Thus the warfare of the world has entered even into the house of God, and sad indeed is the heart of man who has come seeking peace. Um, it's really quite a moving ending to the book, in my estimation. Uh, but there, there was this sense of unity of the churches uh, that Machen is addressing here, this notion of Christian union. And it's oftentimes a union based on pursuit of some kind of what we would call today social justice. Um, and Machen found that really unsatisfactory. And Machen was very much writing against that in this book, Christianity and Liberalism. But it's, it's, it's not, in some ways it was way too late because of uh, what we will see here in this next slide, um, which is, this is portion, just a portion, a couple paragraphs from um, the Plan of Union of 1869 for um, this reunion of the old and new school churches. Um, it's a much longer document, uh, but I do think these quotations reflect much of the spirit of it. Um, so let's look at this. The changes which has, have occurred in our country and throughout the world during the last 30 years, the period of our separation, <clears throat> arrest and compel attention. This is the time, within this time, the original number of our states have been very nearly doubled. And all this vast domain is to be supplied with the means of education and the institutions of religion as the only source and protection of our national life. I'll just pause there to, to notice. This is a church document about union of two communions, two Presbyterian communions. And their reference here is almost exclusively the needs of the nation. Not the needs of the world, not the needs of the church, but the needs of the United States. It's great to minister to the United States, but this is a church, oh, by the way, what is the church's name? The Presbyterian Church in the USA. This is, this is very much a national church with a national mission. Um, <clears throat> the population crowding into this immense area is heterogeneous. Six millions of immigrants representing various religious and nationalities have arrived on our shores within the last 30 years and four millions of slaves recently enfranchised demand Christian education. It is no secret that anti-Christian forces, Romanism, ecclesiasticism, rationalism, infidelity, materialism, and paganism itself, assuming new vitality, are struggling for the ascendancy. Christian forces should be combined and deployed according to the new movements of their adversaries. It is no time for small and weak detachments which may easily be defeated in detail. A lesson has been given us in recent years as to the ease with which diversities of sentiment may be harmonized and combined in one purpose to maintain national life. In other words, we were able to come together to preserve the union. The church should learn from that union preserving mentality and also engage in another union to fight a whole nother battle, a series of battles of various <clears throat> Uh, wrong ideas, wrong beliefs that are entering into the United States. So this is, this is a church union to preserve a Christian America. And many of us may resonate with the idea of a Christian America, um, 
although that doesn't necessarily f work real well sometimes with also the religious freedoms protected in the Constitution. Um, but this is part of what's going on right here in 1869, uh, 50 years again before Machen wrote Christianity and uh, Liberalism. So this uh, goes on. Um, the necessity of a closer union among Christians of a common faith and order has come to be felt in a new sense by the members of our several churches. It cannot be denied that there exists a widespread and earnest longing for more of visible union among all classes of Christian people. And then um, just using an image here, uh, this is a man by the name of Philip Schaff who had been a professor at Mercersburg Seminary, which was a German reformed uh, church seminary in Mercersburg, Pennsylvania, eventually went on to become a um, professor of church history at Union Seminary in New York City. Ding, ding, ding. Remember, what comes out of New York City is not necessarily a good thing. Um, Schaff is a really interesting guy, but he was one of the also leading proponents of reformed ecumenism, Presbyterian ecumenism. Uh, and not just an ecumenism for Presbyterian Reformed churches in the United States, but also because of his German background with, between North America and, and Europe. So anyway, that's why his, his slide is in here. Now picking up with this plan of union, the last paragraph I have for you here. Many of the ecclesiastical organizations of Protestant Europe had their origins in remote controversies connected with the Reformation. I mean, that sentence in and of itself is startling every time I read it because the controversies that led to the Reformation, ding, ding, this is Reformation Day. And we have a man wearing orange to, to celebrate that in some ways. Um, <clears throat> how could Reformed churches think that the Reformation controversies are of remote uh, interest or, or importance? But that's what they're saying here. We have new problems facing us. What happened in the 16th or 17th centuries is remote compared to what we're now facing. <clears throat> they go on, that was, the, that was a time for the assertion of truth rather than for the expression of love. I'm not sure that's the way you'd necessarily want to put it, as if you have to choose between truth and love. Nothing is so long-lived and inveterate as ancestral memories and prejudices. Again, the time of truth may have, may have encouraged certain prejudices. Before the world, we are now engaged as a nation in solving the problem of whether it is possible <clears throat> for all the incongruous and antagonistic nationalities thrown upon our shores, exerting their mutual attraction and repulsion to become fixed in one new American sentiment. Again, the church is interested in producing an American sentiment. If the several branches of the Presbyterian Church in this country, representing to a great degree ancestral differences should become cordially united. It must, not only ha it must have not only a direct effect upon the question of our national unity, but reacting by the force of a successful example on the old world must render aid in that direction to all who are striving to reconsider and readjust those combinations which had their origin either in the faults or the necessities of a remote past. <clears throat> so the idea that theology, church government leads to differences and, and um, <clears throat> uh, divisions in the church needs to be put aside and the church now needs to rally to, to form a union of churches but that will also have effects upon the nation but even on international life. It, it really is a uh, remarkable document in 1869 because this is still on the eve of widespread immigration to the United States, which really does kick in in the 1870s and 80s and beyond, that idea of all these immigrants thrown upon our shores. Um, these Presbyterians didn't know what they were in for in the next several decades. Um, so it's, it's a very revealing piece of Presbyterian sentiment. Again, 50 years before Machen, uh, comes onto the scene in, in the Presbyterian world, as it were, roughly 1920. So this leads then to um, make a point about this period between 1970 and 1920 as being the period of Protestant ecumenism and also the social gospel. And you can see the emphasis on unity 
in this piece, but also the idea that the church really needs to affect society, have some uh, effect or have a social uh, role in, in, in the life of the nation. Um, so sometimes we think of the social gospel, say, one way of putting it, and Protestant ecumenism sort of being two different elements of Protestantism in this period, but actually they went together because usually what drove churches to cooperate more and even to contemplate union during this period was for, again, the idea of creating a Christian America, retaining the Christian identity of the place, and doing that, again, through a host of um, <clears throat> social reforms, among them eventually prohibition, temperance societies blossom into prohibition, which lasts between 1919 and 1933, uh, but also an emphasis a lot of, but on a lot of things that many of us would consider important. Family life, concern for mothers, and protecting them, and their, and their importance of their, their work with children, education, a lot of sort of mainstream middle class ideals that are good for the health of a society, but it's not necessarily the case, at least in my estimation, and I think Machen, I learned a lot of this from Machen, it's not necessarily what the church itself is called to do. Uh oh. Okay, um, is that going to keep happening? Okay, we're okay. Um, so, <clears throat> between 1869 and 1920, the um, Protestant, major Protestant denominations in the United States engaged in various efforts of church union. And again, here, Philip Schaff is uh, the backdrop for, for thinking about this. In 1867, there was a group formed called the Evangelical Alliance. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk more in the, in the next hour uh, presentation about the significance of that name, perhaps evangelical. But this was a way for Protestants to cooperate in a number of these um, uh, domestic uh, home life initiatives, educational initiatives, in many respects picking up on the second Pretty Good Awakening and the benevolent empire um, ideals, voluntary societies that we talked about last night. <clears throat> but eventually these uh, measures of cooperation lead to uh, the formation in 1908 of the Federal Council of Churches, um, which in 1951 changes its name to the National Council of Churches. Now, for those of you old enough to have grown up, say, um, in the 50s or 60s, uh, I grew up in the 60s, not the 50s, um, National Cur Ch Council of Churches used to matter. It used to be a really big deal. It, w it, was, it was the, um, the institutional embodiment of mainline Protestantism. Uh, you can't find news stories at all anymore about the National Council of Churches. It is amazing that within 40 years, they've gone into being just completely insignificant and evangelicals have rushed in to fill the void, uh, whatever evangelicalism is. But, so the Federal Council was a, was a big deal. This was a way for these Protestant churches, major denominations, to cooperate on a number of fronts, again, with the social gospel as a backdrop for, for ways in which they would cooperate. And I'll give you an example of that social gospel in just, just a minute. But the word federal is important, and so when they changed their name to national, that's also important. But federal, this meant that, like the federal union that we have in the United States, each denomination would retain some of its own autonomy, the way the states have retained some of their autonomy. Um, but they would come together in this federal union and cooperate and in some kind of federated government. Um, now, one of the first, very first things that they did when they met in Philadelphia in 1908 was to produce a social creed. You may have thought that churches would produce theological creeds, but this is a social creed for the, for the churches. And I won't go through all of this, but these are the points in this social creed, which again is indicative of the social gospel, which is also indicative of the progressive movement in politics. Um, 
So we have here for the equal rights and protection, complete justice for all men in all stations of life, for the right of all men to the opportunity for self-maintenance and a right to be wisely and strongly safeguarded against encroachments of every kind, for the right of workers to some protection against the hardships often res resulting from the swift crisis of industrial change, <clears throat> for the principle of conciliation and arbitration in industrial relations, dissensions, excuse me, for the protection of the worker from dangerous machinery, occupational disease, injuries, and mortality, for the abolition of child labor, for such regulation of the conditions of toil for women as shall safeguard the physical and moral health of the community, for the gradual and re reasonable reduction of the hours of labor to the lowest practical point, and for that degree of leisure for all which is a condition of the highest human life for a release from employment one day in seven, so they were Sabbatarian, for a living wage as a minimum in every industry and for the highest wage that each industry can afford, for the most equitable division of the products of industry that can ultimately be devised, for suitable provision for the old age of the workers and for those incapacitated by injury for the abatement of poverty. Um, some of those very specific, some of those also very vague. And I, I said I wasn't going to read them all, but I did. Uh, I think it's useful in some ways to let that wash over us to think, well, wait, how would a church or how would churches actually um, ratify this? Is there any kind of biblical warrant for this? Is there any kind of theological warrant for this? Um, what, what exactly is this? What does this have to do with the church or with Christianity? Uh, it has a lot to do with American politics at the time. Industrialization uh, and, and immigrant workforce raised a whole set of social difficulties for the United States that many people were concerned about. The populist movement starts in the 1890s, that's if I get that right. The progressive movement comes along as well to respond to some of this. Eventually, the New Deal will also respond to some of these problems. Um, and it makes sense for government to respond to this, but why would the churches feel compelled to respond to this? Um, it's also striking that a number of these points are, are points right out of the progressive uh, movement's political ideals. Um, and a number of these are, are pieces of uh, policy that Machen himself would have written against at different points in his, in his life. For instance, the, um, the abolition of child labor. While on the one hand, that makes a lot of sense, um, but is it, is it, <laughs> it's one more instance of the way that Americans respond to a crisis, lock it down, shut it down, stop it, rather than actually trying to work out some provision for families that may need income from the, the labor that children are performing, uh, how, how do you work around that in some way? Um, and Machen didn't like the idea, by the way, of the federal government legislating for families what families could do. Um, that was his big objection to that. So um, this, is, this is indicative of both the federal union signifying the union of churches that new school, old school Presbyterians in some ways kicked off at the end of the Civil War, <clears throat> and then also this social gospel piece of it, the churches responding to the needs of the nation. Um, and so this is, uh, this is the backdrop then to another effort to unite the churches in an organic union of churches. I was speaking to one uh, of the, the attendees last night about this. The 1920 plan for organic union. Um, this would have united, instead of having a federal union, this would have been an organic union. All the churches would have uh, united into one church. Ideally, that was the plan that came out of World War I. Notice, by the way, after the War for Independence, Presbyterians and Congregationalists have a plan of union to plant churches in the upper, what we now know as the upper Midwest. After the Civil War, Presbyterians, old school, new school, unite to, uh, for PCUSA, but also to engage in various social endeavors. After World War I, now there's another ambitious plan for union. War breeds union. 
it's, it's, a, it's really important point, I think, to notice about church history. Um, anyway, 1920, this plan for organic union comes to the churches. What might that, it failed, it failed miserably. It's one of the reasons why we don't talk about it much in church history. It was overly ambitious. They didn't have the money for it, even though John D. Rockefeller, the, one of the great uh, industrialist oil man, put up lots of money for it. Um, but what it might have looked like was what happened in Canada. In Ca Western Protestants were engaged in this church union effort across the board. Canada was another example of this. So what happened there was a plan for Anglicans, Methodists, and Presbyterians to join together and form a United Church of Canada, which they did in 1925. But what it did was not eliminate the Anglican, Methodist, and Presbyterian churches. It just created one more denomination. Now you had a United Church of Canada, you had a Presbyterian Church of Canada, you had a Methodist Church of Canada, and you had an Anglican Church of Canada. The conservatives in those churches wanted to hold on to their own denominational identities. They had different ideas about theology and church government, of all things. Uh, it's also interesting to note that the Presbyterians who stayed out of that church union in Canada wanted to hire Machen to be the president of their seminary, Knox College, in, um, <clears throat> in Montreal. Um, so Machen had some affinities for what was going on in Canada as well. Um, but anyway, this plan for organic union comes to the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in 1920. That's the first time that Machen is a commissioner at a general assembly in the course of his life. He's just come back from Europe. He had served in Europe for, for about a year as part of the YMCA, as I mentioned last night, uh, at the front in France. He goes there, and who is presenting this um, plan for union other than the president of Princeton Seminary? So you might already be thinking, what is going on with the president of Princeton Seminary? a seminary that had been very much identified with old school Presbyterianism, very much em uh, interested in preserving Calvinist orthodoxy, very much interested in preserving Presbyterian church government. Why would the president of Princeton Seminary be joined to this endeavor? Well, he was serving on the committee that w w the Presbyterian uh, wing of this plan of organic union, so he, it was his uh, turn to present this to the General Assembly but this is indicative of then a controversy that just ignites Princeton Seminary throughout the 1920s um, and leads eventually to the founding of Westminster Seminary. The divisions among the faculty and administration at Westminster eventually lead to uh, the creation of Westminster in 1929. Um, so there's already uh, just amazing things happening here in 1920 at this General Assembly. It's also the case, though, that um, <clears throat> Machen's book, Christianity and Liberalism, comes right out of this controversy. I was going to ask uh, Joe, and I forgot to ask, so I have to you have to take, take it from me. But if you look at the book, Christianity and Liberalism, there's a preface in it that says the origins of the book came from a talk that Machen made before the Presbytery of Chester. Um, in 1921 on liberalism and Christianity. Um, now, what happened here was that Machen, attending the General Assembly in Philadelphia in 1920, um, he got, came to know other conservatives in the church who were concerned about this church union effort. Elders in the uh, Presbytery of Chester asked Machen to come down and give a talk. I don't know if they knew him before this or not. He wasn't that widely known in 1920 or 1921. His first book, The Origin of Paul's Religion, came out in 1921, which is a series of lectures on Paul given at uh, Union Seminary in Richmond. So Machen still was maybe better known in the Southern Church than he was in the Northern Church, even though he'd been teaching at, West, at Princeton excuse me, for, since 1906. Um, Machen gives this talk, has it published in the Princeton Theological Review, and then people said, why don't you work this into a book? So the book itself is not, say, responding to the same sorts of concerns that fundamentalists had. Fundamentalists were very much concerned about evolution, Scopes trial sort of being the big uh, episode in fundamentalist history, 1925, the Scopes trial in Dayton, Tennessee. 
Uh, Machen, William Jennings Bryan asked Machen to testify at, at the Scopes trial, and uh, Machen kind of looked at his watch and said, oh, I may be busy that week. But um, <laughs> Machen also said, quite plausibly, I'm not an expert in the Old Testament. So they were getting into what does the, the first three chapters of Genesis mean. I don't think Machen uh, reflected a lot on Old Testament material or the Pentateuch, which doesn't say, say that he didn't have ideas about it, it just wasn't what he, he followed. Um, fundamentalists were also very much concerned about uh, the return of Christ. Dispensationalism, a way of interpreting uh, es eschatological end times teaching in the Bible, um, which was very popular at one time, and maybe it's still popular here because Dallas Seminary was such a uh, promoter of this set of this way of understanding the Bible, and I understand Dallas is still sort of a Dallas seminary is still going on, and maybe has a some kind of a footprint in this area. So I don't know how deeply people are still attached to dispensationalism. Uh, if you ever encountered a Schofield Reference Bible, which I won two of those, those as a youth growing up, various competitions in Sunday school. Um, it has all the notes interpreting the Bible from this dispensational perspective. Again, that was a big part of the fundamentalist movement that was taking off in the 19-teens, 1920s. And Machen didn't even know anything about dispensationalism. It, that, that became an issue in the, o, in the OPC in 1936 when there was a split between the o, Orthodox Presbyterians and the Bible Presbyterians. Um, and Machen was sort of surprised to know that this was going on because dispensationalism circulated in Bible conference networks, which was in some ways beyond the scope of, of Machen's own uh, travels and interests. So those were two hallmarks of fundamentalism, both certain views about creation, certain views about the end of time, when Christ will return. Machen's book, Christianity and Liberalism, is, comes out of this controversy over church union, social gospel, and it also emphasizes the work of Christ. The longest chapter in the book is about salvation. The longest section in the book, as I counted pages at least, that's not always the best way to read, but still it's important if an author devotes more attention to this than other topics. If he goes on for, I think, at least 10 pages to defend the doctrine of the vicarious atonement, you might think, wait, this is what is important to this guy. And it was. He says very little about inerrancy in the book, a couple pages. Thinks it's important, but he doesn't think that's at the root of the issue either. The doctrine of Christ is really what's important to Machen in, in this book. Um, so, um, so Machen, in writing Christianity and Liberalism, which really launches his career in combating liberalism in the Presbyterian Church, um, he's standing up against a, a uh, development set of circumstances that have been going on for 50 years in American Protestantism. And that's one reason for thinking it was too little, too late. <clears throat> but it is, um, was also just a very important part of mainline Protestantism. To try to understand mainline Protestantism, you need to think about ecumenism and the social gospel which were really very much at loggerheads with old school Presbyterianism and what the old school represented. Which is why so many people, like myself at least, think of this reunion of the old school and new school as being a uh, tragic moment in Presbyterian history. But to um, <clears throat> give you a sense of what this theology uh, of the mainline churches looked like, um, about two years ago, a man, uh, Michael Doran, or Doran, Doran, I think it is. Uh, he recently came to Hillsdale to speak at a conference on foreign policy. He was in the George W. Bush administration doing foreign policy. He wrote a, uh, an essay in First Things that I highly, highly recommend about uh, two different ideas of American foreign policy during the 20s and 30s. Um, and uh, what's striking about this is he contrasts more or less fundamental fundamentalist Protestantism with mainline Protestantism or liberal Protestantism as under trying to understand either the, an Andrew Jacksonian, Andrew Jackson or Jacksonian foreign policy, which many people have tried to put President Trump into that mold, versus a Wilsonian internationalist foreign policy, which would be more typical of mainline Protestantism. 
that may be way more foreign policy than you want to consider, even though, of course, the United States is having this huge global footprint, we may, as Americans, want to think about foreign policy more, not as Orthodox Presbyterians, mind you, as <laughs> Americans. Um, but it's striking to me that Duran would pick up on the theology that was at work in both sides of a foreign policy debate. He doesn't pay attention to Machen in this. He pays much more attention to William Jennings Bryan, who was the chief prosecutor at the, at the Scopes trial, was also a Presbyterian fundamentalist. He didn't give Machen much support in the controversies of the 1920s. Um, <clears throat> but still, here's just one uh, paragraph from this article, which I think does illustrate uh, what Machen was up against. Uh, Duran writes, Protestant modernism also shifted the focus from personal piety to collective action. It thus became the natural religious home for social reform initiatives. The trend culminated <clears throat> in the social gospel movement of the early 20th century. Walter Rauschenbusch, its leading figure, depicted the historical Jesus as a social activist, an ethicist who eschewed dogma. Deeds, not creeds, might have been Rauschenbusch's slogan. The elimination of social injustice through education, age of the poor, and government restraint of capitalist excesses. These were now the highest callings of the Christian. The traditional focus of the church on saving souls became secondary. The primary goal of Christian life was eliminating human suffering. This task required breaking down the barriers that separate man from his fellow man. Religiously minded progressives <clears throat> defined el eliminating divisions among Protestant denominations as the first step toward this goal. Before long, their, view, their vision became universal in scope, and they began working to dissolve the barriers among Christians, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, and pagans. This project continued with gusto even as the religiously minded fell by the wayside. As society secularized, the progressive persuasion promoted promoted equality between the sexes and among America's racial and socioeconomic groups. <clears throat> so this is important, what he says here, especially about uh, trying to dissolve barriers among Christians, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, and pagans for understanding the, uh, the, the end of Machen's career because he died in 1937 um, so the last <clears throat> five years of his life were devoted to a controversy over foreign missions in the Presbyterian Church. Um, and uh, one, and this, this fellow, Michael Duran, in this article writes in some ways about the document that, that created this controversy over Protestant foreign missions. So again, the missionary enterprise of the Protestant churches was bound up in, in many respects with the foreign policy initiatives of the American government during this time. Um, this is in some ways why you might want to call it the so-called Protestant establishment. It wasn't established officially by government because America still believes in religious freedom for all religious groups, but white Protestants had um, a certain amount of privilege uh, in, in elite circles and that carried over into uh, foreign policy. And in some ways it makes sense too, before you get the rise of a class of elite professionals doing foreign policy in the State Department. Uh, if you want to know about life on the ground in China or Korea or Japan or somewhere else, you might call up the missionaries to see what they think about what's going on there. There was a real natural symbiosis at times between American foreign policy elites and the missions movement. <clears throat> but in 1932, the church, um, again, a united effort of seven denominations come together to form uh, a committee to study foreign missions overseas. It's called the Layman's Commission or Rethinking Missions. Um, <clears throat> and this is specifically designed to study foreign missions uh, in China. And uh, the person who writes the report, sometimes also called the Hawking Report, Edward Hawking, I think was his first name, um, was a, get this, a professor of philosophy at Harvard University. You don't th typically think of professors of philosophy writing reports about foreign missions, let alone professors of philosophy at Harvard writing this. But again, this, sh this is a, 
a suggestion of how uh, interpenetrated the mainline churches were with elite institutions in American society. What this report does is basically to say the old rationale for missions, the idea of saving souls, saving people for eternity, is dead. That's really not what the church should be about. The church should be about uh, improving social conditions in other parts of the world. <clears throat> really, the mission should be much more about humanitarian endeavor than about, um, about making people Christian. And that's why Duran's line here about Christians cooperating with um, <clears throat> Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, etc., is very revealing. That there, there is an effort by Protestant missionaries, at least coming out of this report, they should try, try to cooperate with other religious groups, again, to improve society as much as possible in these other places. And that means help it with agriculture, it means help with economic, it means help economics, help with education, all hospitals, medicine, etc. All the sorts of things that people in the West enjoy, other people around the world should also enjoy. Well, the report comes out in 1932, and Machen begins to uh, object to it, does, takes some steps in, at the level of presbytery, eventually a, an overture to General Assembly, he has a debate with uh, the head of the Presbyterian Foreign Mission Board, um, uh, Robert Speer, very popular figure in, in the Presbyterian Church. Um, none of these efforts uh, come to much, and so Machen then founds the Independent Board for Presbyterian Foreign Missions in 1934 um, as a way to say, no, we're going to support real missionaries who are going to go out and present the true gospel. Uh, and it was a very humble effort. I think they sent out maybe six or seven missionaries at first. Um, but the Presbyterian Church objects to this. The Presbyterian Church says, no, this is illegal. Uh, you can't do this. Machen comes to trial. This Presbyterian tries him for insubordination uh, in the church. And uh, he is tried, found guilty, and excommunicated from the church eventually in 1936 which leads to the formation of the OPC in 1936. So um, Machen begins his, his controversial career, say, or his career of controversy in 1920 with opposing church union and the social gospel that's coming with the plan of organic union. And now in the 1930s, the second piece of that with the foreign missions controversy, he's still trying to oppose that same progressive mindset that has taken over and dominated the mainline Protestant churches. So Machen is remarkable in, in any number of ways, um, but he's especially remarkable in, in seeing how insidious this, uh, this development was in the church and, and, and standing up and trying to resist it as he did. Um, and you could argue he wasn't successful in many ways because the mainline church continued to go down this road. On the other hand, he was successful in other ways because he was able to help form a communion that would continue to uh, uphold old, old school Presbyterian sorts of convictions. Um, I think I'll stop there and uh, see if you have questions, comments, um, John, what's that? I was going to say, I think it's interesting to see how this movement literally rendered so many denominations. I mean, you have the three primary Methodist, Protestant, or uh, Presbyterian, and, and Baptist even that had divisions over these ideals that <clears throat> unity was more important than the uh, gospel was. Right. I would only qualify that, though, to say there weren't as many divisions as I might have thought there'd be, just as perhaps there aren't as many protests about the COVID restrictions as I thought there might be. Um, don't, I, sh I should avoid this, but. Too late. Because I put my mask back I'm sure all of you have, have maybe thought this, but when have you ever had to think about whether it's legal to leave your home? Maybe that's what we have to do, but still. Um, anyway, that's why I think it's remarkable. Um, so 
I would have thought maybe more churches would split. And there were sort of minor controversies here and there. Even the Episcopalians had a controversy in some ways over modernism. But um, aside from Baptists and Presbyterians, there weren't the number of denominations founded. Now, what you did probably have more of is congregations leaving and just becoming independent. And so you have, I don't know what the statistics are, but I suspect you would have had an uptick of uh, independent congregations formed coming out of different backgrounds. But go ahead. My thought would also be that it's almost like Machen's book itself and the timelessness of it is that <clears throat> the Methodist Church recently, the culmination of, the, of this is, has reached them where they're struggling with the division right. and the splitting potential. So within the 100 years since, it's like it's taken some places much longer right. to get there than others. And so whereas we were definitely at the beginning of this, there are others still struggling today. Right. This won't sound the most charitable, um, but it, it somewhat uh, uh, intrigues me, at least, is, is one way of putting it, that it took the issue of homosexuality and gay marriage to produce this rather than thinking about, wait a minute, people are denying the deity of Christ way, well before this. Right. Um, so we're spooked by certain people, and that's what's really going to lead us to do this, rather than maybe having been spooked about certain ideas uh, prior to this. So, and the same is true for um, Presbyterians. Um, certain groups have left the PCUSA over these issues as well, as well as the uh, Anglican Communion of North America comes out of uh, similar concerns about um, ordination of homosexuals and, and gay marriage. So, um, so anyway, the, back to your point, I, I, I guess there were church splits, but in some ways these were minor, especially if you look at a hi history textbooks of American history. They'll do, do a couple chapters on, I mean paragraphs at least on the Scopes trial, but almost nothing on these church controversies. Uh, yes. I, I just think it's interesting what what I hear you saying is com compared to the fundamentalist movement or fundamentalist controversy during a similar time frame, that was more focused on inerrancy of scripture. And, and this is more focused on, it, it seems like the people who were advocating for unity at all costs weren't necessarily denying um, yeah, but I don't think they cared about it much. I mean, so for instance, um, I mean, they, they mocked it in certain ways, at least to use the example of Harry Emerson Fosdick, who in some ways started the, the Presbyterian controversy as it, as it existed within the Northern Presbyterian Church. He preached a sermon in May of 1922 called, Shall the Fundamentalists Win? And in that sermon, he, he basically said, it, it, you know, these fool uh, fundamentalists are telling us we need to have a certain view of Christ's return and a certain theory of an inspiration of the Bible. And they're going to kick us out for that. Uh, so in, and, and he's important because he's, he's a Baptist, a liberal Baptist, preaching at a Presbyterian c congregation in New York City, First Presbyterian. And conservatives in the Presbytery of New York are kind of wait, what's going on here that we have a liberal Baptist doing stated supply in a Presbyterian church? In the, in the context of church union, well, we're all the same, Methodist, Baptist, kind of, you know, of course we'd have, but so they, that leads to uh, a series of um, investigations or criticisms of the Presbytery of New York. New York, New York, um, that, that again, sort of is the backdrop for other controversies that carried on at the, at the level of the General Assembly in the 1920s. Uh, so in that sense, that's one way of measuring the attachment of, say, unionists to, in, to inerrancy. I don't think they really paid much attention to it. Because if you look at that, again, that list of, of um, well, this is William Henry Roberts, by the way. Who was he? He was the stated clerk of the PCUSA for a long, long time of uh, the General Assembly. 
uh, and he was a leader in these church union efforts. Sorry for not identifying that. Let's just have an image up there. But I mean, do you think the people who wrote these these um, <coughs> affirmations in this social creed were thinking at all about the inerrancy of the Bible? It's hard for me to to imagine that they were. Uh, again, they these may be useful points of public policy, but what's a church doing trying to debate? this. Uh, we, we probably couldn't get Orthodox Presbyterians to agree on use of masks, uh, let alone <laughs> child labor. So, <laughs> Yes? Uh, so, back, so to your point of uh, Michael, you know, the, the article with Michael Grant, kind of, so I, I've been endlessly fascinated by, you know, the parallels between politics politics um, and in your denominations and the ways of thinking and the, you know and so obviously you've touched on a lot of that is there any kind is there any resources that really extensively cover the subject of just um, like I said the, these these tendencies and these mindsets that both in the you know conservatives in a denomination and also conservatives in the world of politics liberals versus liberals is there something that, that Covers it pretty extensively. Um, I guess, I mean, as I'm thinking off the top of my head, and there are, are many books that you could read that pick up on parts of this story. Um, but I was, okay, shameless self promotion. Uh, a colleague, a friend of mine who teaches history at Queen's University in Belfast, we've started a podcast, but we've spelled it podcast uh, because that's the way the Brits pronounce podcast. They pronounce it podcast. Um, and my wife and I sort of chuckle whenever we listen to British BBC podcasts. Um, anyway, we just had a fellow on talking to him Monday. Uh, this is called a religious nationalism podcast. We have a website, et cetera, et cetera. You can download these. Um, I think we're even on Spotify, all this you know, cliched places where you can listen to podcasts. Uh, Daniel Williams is the fellow's name who teaches at West Georgia University. He's an, I th he's an evangelical of some kind. He writes occasionally for Gospel Coalition, among other places. Uh, and he, and he did a book called um, God's Own Party about the origins of the Christian right, especially the Protestant right. Um, the other side of that equation, in some ways, is the contribution that Roman Catholics have made. And he did, his second book was on the pro-life movement, which was largely organized by Roman Catholics initially. Um, so those would be two resources to look. It doesn't give the full story, but th those are the kind of books that might help fill in that picture of Protestants and politics in the 20th century and why mainline people would have gone one way and conservatives may be the other way. Though it's also important to keep in mind that many people who are mainline, who are members of mainline churches are not necessarily liberal politically. It's the leadership of the churches more so that may adopt certain measures, but where the laity fits is oftentimes a different matter. So, so it's elitist, yeah, a lot of it. Yeah. And I know, uh, and of course I know Marsden covers some of it, but it, it doesn't seem to be real extensive, you know, sort right. of Marsden. Any other questions or comments? Well, I saw Harry's hand in the back. Can I hear you, Jim? Well, I guess I'll try this. Um, <laughs> and it's a dangerous thing of pushing back against one of your ideas that you've expressed. So you can tell me how wrong I am. <laughs> but, um, I like pushback. <laughs> I do. Well, my, my thought is that you know many of those, they weren't as hopeful as five states, but many of those promoting the social gospel certainly would have been sympathetic with more liberal trends in theology. But more commonly, um, my, my thought is that those considered theological questions either to be unimportant or irrelevant to what was important to the culture. And so they just got pushed to the background as, un, as unimportant. The other way that this was, I think, important to the 
the reaction to um, Machen in the 20s is the fact that theological questions were pushed into the background, allowed those that agreed with Machen theologically, nevertheless, to stay with the mainline church, um, and thus um, encourage the idea that Machen was more extreme than he actually was. So I, it seems to me that theological questions can be pushed into the background um, were harmful both to the, to the old school Presbyterianism and then harmful to the quest of Machen to, to reform the church. Okay, I, I, I'm intrigued by that point. Um, so theological questions, it seems to me what you're saying, theological questions being pushed to the background made it seem that Machen could be deemed extreme and therefore taken less seriously. And people who were theologically conservative would have regarded Machen that way and therefore stayed and not left. Yeah, they, if, even if they didn't regard Machen as extreme, the fact that theological questions weren't top of the line right. meant that they were able to justify remaining with um, the, the BCUSA. Okay. I'm just curious, how that, how was that pushback? I mean, it, it's a, <laughs> I don't, I'm not, we don't have to get into pu pushing, um, <laughs> but, but I, it's, it seems like it's a, an amplification of a point, which I think there's a lot of merit to what you're saying, so I'm curious how you see it as pushback, if, if you do. Maybe pushback is too strong of a okay. word, I apologize for that. No, that, you don't need to, I don't care, really. <laughs> I've read 13 of your books, I like you. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. <laughs> but I, I think that, um, I, 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 I was re responding, I think, to um, your de-emphasis on inerrancy and theological questions as leading to the disputes. And, while, and, and really, I think that part of what was happening was tactical, that um, those promoting the social gospel, first of all, considered theological questions unimportant. Secondly, they knew that they could not unite around theological questions, and so they, that got pushed to the background. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess, guess yeah, yeah, I don't necessarily, I don't disagree with that. Um, I guess maybe my only pushback is to think that how did the church come to that position where theology was pushed <laughs> Push back that way it was uh, so de, de emphasized, so unsent, not um, unimportant to what the church was doing. I mean, I, be, you know, I, in some ways, as I become more familiar with Presbyterian history before the United States in England and Scotland, Ireland, uh, what made um, Presbyterians Presbyterian too many times, I think, was the way um, they wanted to be the national church. So there was a political struggle to it. But still, given the importance of the Westminster Assembly and those documents and the way that they were received and the, the image you have sometimes of a Presbyterian being a true catechism, shorter catechism person or something, you would think that doctrine might define Presbyterians more than some other um, strains of, of Protestantism. And so, you know, again, my question then is why, how did it come to be? Um, now, you weren't here last night, and I think last night with the second Pretty Good Awakening, also some of the roots of this were happening then. Um, but, again, there's just, for me, a kind of tragic element to this. But, but I appreciate your comment. Seriously, I, I, I do that. Uh, I, I think we're out of time, probably. We should probably take a break, or Joe, I'll, I'll hand this over to you.